Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of the Bingo Gambit Speedrun series. In this video, we are playing against players in the rating range of 1200 to 1300 in the rapid rating pool on chess.com. And in the three different games we'll be taking a look at, we're going to be prioritizing uh, and focusing on situations where I'm able to gain a space advantage in the middle of the board, specifically. Being able to put two pawns in the center, sometimes three pawns in the center at the right time. Uh, being able to win material in the center of the board because of my space advantage. So mostly focusing on situations where we're able to gain a space advantage from the opening phase. Usually as black, this is not something that you should be able to easily accomplish. So we're going to be seeing kind of some of the errors and mistakes that my opponents make that allowed me to get that space advantage, and then how we're going to be able to play around it in order to get very good positions, get good attacks on the opponent's king, and ultimately win these games. So let's go ahead and jump right into the games that we'll be seeing here. All right, so we've got our first game in the next rating range here. We're going to be playing against players in the rating range of 1,200 to 1,300. Against the move d4, we're going for knight f6, aiming for our bingo gambit if our opponent uh, does decide to play into it. Otherwise, we'll be playing c5 against most moves on the second move of the game. So our opponent goes for the London system this time. We've seen this particular opening uh, a number of times in the previous games. So we're going for c5, challenging our opponent's center, mainly here looking to trade off their central pawn for our non-central pawn if we get the ability to do so. Uh, we've seen players play the move e3 previously. Uh, I think we've seen a game at least maybe one of them with c3. We've also seen a couple of players capture the pawn on c5. I think capturing on c5 is the most common move in this rating range. Um, objectively speaking here, d5 is a pretty good move. Uh, it, it is very rare, I will say. Most people who are playing the London system aren't used to pushing their pawn up to the d5 square, so they're not really uh, planning on doing that. So we'll see what our opponent goes for. So they go for the move c3. They are reinforcing the pawn that's on the d4 square. So in this position here, we are going to go for the move queen to b6. This is the move I tend to recommend in these London system positions. You go for a very early queen to b6 move, and you're really trying to take advantage of your opponent uh, who has developed the bishop off of the c1 square early in the game. And then you're trying to attack, to attack the b2 pawn that is lacking protection. So white decides to go for the move pawn to b3. The downside of the move pawn to b3 is it does soften up some of the uh, dark squares around the queen side part of the board. There's not a ton we can do about that right away, uh, as far as I'm aware, but this is something that white may have to uh, factor in as the game progresses. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go for the move g6, put the bishop on g7, and try to kind of take advantage of the fact that there's no pawn on b2 anymore. Uh, and try to use this slightly more open diagonal towards the opponent's rook that's on a1. So let's go for g6. Uh, I don't think this is the only good move. You could also start with knight to c6 maybe, or trade pawns first. Um, but we're going to go for the setup of g6, put the bishop on the g7 square. And the game plan here that we're going to aim for is we're eventually going to play the moves d5, which I very well may just play right away here. And... Later, we're going to try to play the move pawn to e5. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of extra preparation because white does have the bishop on f4 and the pawn on d4. They are protecting the e5 square pretty well. Uh, but that is going to be kind of the game plan. Right now, I am going to play the move d5. I don't want to let white jump their knight forward and attack my queen too easily. So I'm going to play the move d5. And I'm not necessarily in a rush to trade pawns on d4 at any point. Uh, right now, if we look at the pawns that are in the center of the board, I, uh, or at least across the fourth and fifth ranks of the board, if we look across these two ranks here, I have two pawns compared to my opponent's one pawn, so I have a space advantage across the center of the board or across these two ranks of the board. If I was to trade the pawns and white was to recapture, then my c5 pawn would be uh, would disappear and white's d4 pawn would get replaced with their e3 pawn, for example, and then it would be a one versus one uh, situation. I wouldn't have a space advantage anymore. So this is a case in chess which is known as tension, when you have two pawns kind of battling off or facing off against one another. In most situations, you don't want to be the first one to blink, so to speak, or make the first capture, unless you're really getting something beneficial out of it. So I don't really want to rush to take this pawn at any point. Uh, I would actually be pretty happy if white was to take my pawn, because once the queen recaptures, then it ends up that this diagonal for my bishop is opened up a bit more because the d4 pawn is gone. 
And I would still have a space advantage in the center because it wouldn't be a two versus one, but it would be a one versus zero when the d4 and c5 pawns disappear. All that being said, white develops the bishop to the d3 square. I'm going to go ahead and um, not sure if castling first or knight to c6 first is better. Um, I'm going to go for knight c6 first. Part of my idea here may also to be the, the play the move knight h5 and maybe hunt down the opponent's bishop that is on the f4 square. Many times in the London system, players here will play a move like h3 to give the bishop an escape square. This particular opponent does not go for that idea. So they still have the bishop on the f4 square. I could castle here, but I think I'm going to play a little bit more uh, proactively, you could say. I'm going to go for the move knight to h5 in this position, attacking this bishop that's on the f4 square. I'm assuming the bishop will either go to g5 or g3. And depending on where they move, I'm going to try to strike with the move e5 very quickly in the center of the board. And essentially with the move e5, uh, you know, again, assuming the bishop had moved away, playing the move e5, the idea there would be to open up the middle of the board very quickly and to gain a bigger space advantage. Because right now, as I mentioned, it is a two versus one situation. If I put the other pawn on the e5 square, assuming, again, that the bishop moves, uh, then it would be a three versus one situation. I'd have an even bigger space advantage. And on top of all of that, I really want to try to get rid of the d4 pawn so that my bishop is more on an uh, on a more open diagonal, especially aiming toward the, towards this pawn on c3 that is less protected. And again, this pawn on c3 is less protected because we kind of induced or uh, encouraged white to play the move b3 earlier in the game when we played the move queen to b6. Okay, that all being said, white decided to castle the king. They did not move the bishop away. And the problem for that, uh, or the problem with that for them, is going to be that the pawn on d4 and the bishop on f4, they are both supported by, oops, sorry, they are both supported by the exact same pawn here on e3. And what I can do is I can capture one of them. I can either take the pawn first and then the bishop, or take the bishop then the pawn. And once there's less coverage on either one of these squares. Uh, once the e3 pawn has been pulled away from one of them, then we can uh, look to win the other one. So I don't really know if it's better to take the pawn or the bishop first, quite honestly. If I take the bishop first, there might be a world where white takes back, uh, or sorry, uh, takes on c5 first, attacking my queen, maybe. Uh, I don't know if that's really that big of a deal. I would recapture with my pawn, my queen, they get my knight, I take the pawn on c3, and I think white's going to be down a pawn anyways. But all that being said, I'm going to take the pawn on d4 first. I'm just going to do this particular order of captures. I want to take away this pawn takes c5 option, just not even let that be an option for, uh, for white to consider. And next we'll take the bishop on the f4 square. We'll pull the pawn away from e3. If white takes back with the e3 pawn, then they're simply going to lose the bishop like a full piece at that point, which is very bad. They should take back on d4 with either the c pawn or the knight. But now we can take the bishop. They're going to take back with their pawn. And then the pawn on d4 has only one protector. We have three attackers. We are going to take with our knight. And now we are just ahead a pawn in this position. We're also aiming towards the opponent's rook. We've succeeded in opening up this entire diagonal towards that rook there. Uh, and now we want to recapture the knight, of course. Now, here we want to be a bit careful. My first instinct, you know, would be to take with the queen because I do actually attack the bishop and the rook and set up a lot of different threats. What I don't like about taking with the queen, though, is we have to think about what our opponent's options are in response. Do, does our opponent have a check, a capture, a threat? Uh, if you take with the queen, you, I will also point out, you're also attacking the f4 pawn, so it looks very good. I'm a little bit bothered by the fact that white can throw in the move bishop to b5 check. If I move the king, you know, that's a potential drawback to things. And if I uh, block with the bishop, he can trade bishops on d7, and then again, my king has already moved. So I do think bishop takes knight is going to be safer in this position. Um, that being said, the fact that I am attacking the f4 pawn makes me want to actually go for this queen takes d4 move a little bit more, because even if my king becomes a little bit unsafe in the short term, I will potentially pick up a second pawn, which is going to be very nice for the long term. And so... 
I would think here that I don't know. I'm actually not entirely sure if Bishop Takes or Queen Takes is better. Queen Takes is riskier, but also more rewarding. Bishop Takes is more solid, but less rewarding, right? Less risk, less reward. Um, which option should I go for? Um, I'm going to go for the more solid option. Uh, I do think in a lot of the games through the speedruns, I kind of take a little bit more of a risky approach, and I think I can usually get away with it because I'm just a stronger player than most you know than the players I'm playing against but I do know that sometimes for the purposes of you know viewers who are watching the games in the video um, sometimes you know you might think that I should you know maybe I should play a little more reserved and play a little bit more like the rating range of the players I'm playing against so I'm gonna take the slightly more conservative approach take with the bishop let's go ahead and castle now and yeah so it's safer in the sense that I'm not getting really attacked or uh, or gonna you know run into checkmate threats or anything like that uh, here I am going to retreat the bishop. Um, let's go to the f6 square. kind of like the idea of restricting this knight and protecting my pawn. And uh, yeah, so we're up a pawn. The pawn on f4 is doubled, so maybe that's a target I can look to attack. Uh, we have the bishop here, which is nice. We have a pass pawn in the center of the board, which is also nice. I'm going to really just look to improve my pieces, especially my bishop and rooks that are not in the game yet. And I'm going to look to trade pieces. The only type of endgame I want to avoid is going to be an opposite color bishop endgame. So for example, if I was to play something like bishop g4 and take this knight, we would be getting a little bit close to an opposite color bishop scenario. Um, okay, so that being said, white plays the move pawn to f5. They are looking to potentially trade off their doubled pawn. I think I can just take this pawn though. I don't want to take with the bishop because white could trade bishops and then take the pawn on d5 that would be unprotected. But I think if I just take with the pawn, I can always play the move pawn to e6 to reinforce all of my pawns here. It looks a little bit risky because my king is a little more exposed, uh, but it is a second pawn that I'm ahead. And I can always play king h8 and rook g8, and that's a very easy way to fix a king that's opened up on a g-file. You, you can actually kind of uh, flip the script on the opponent, move the king over, use the g-file yourself, and on top of it, I am just up a pawn. So uh, I will probably play e6 to defend everything pretty well, move the king over, swing the rook over, uh, maybe you know develop the bishop, double the rooks up on the g file, try to move things over in the king side direction. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of an advantage on the queen side, quite honestly. It's kind of equal. I have an advantage in the center, and I have an advantage on the king side. That's where my kind of extra pawns are uh, in this position. So I think it makes a lot of sense to play some combination of e6, king h8, rook g8, get the pieces over towards the king side, and try to do that. So white moves the queen to c2. They're lining up towards the pawn. Let's play e6 to protect that. No, no big problem. And against, I think, almost anything white can do here, I'm probably playing king h8 and rook g8. I think that's my next two moves against almost every move. Um... I may start with the move queen to d6 first. I kind of want to keep his knight from jumping forward, quite honestly. And okay, next I'll do king g8, or uh, king h8, rook h8. And again, when you're ahead in material like I am here, I'm ahead two pawns. A very big thing in these types of positions is trying to restrict or prevent your opponent from the ideas that they want to go for. Uh, so here, for example, white wants to play queen h6. I think that's their idea. I could still go king h8. But I think I might actually go king g7. Yeah, I'm going to do it this way. I, I, I'm i kind of holding off on my idea of getting the rook to the g-file for a moment. But I'm trying to prevent my opponent from in, uh, kind of moving their pieces into my side of the board. Maybe I'll prioritize developing the queen side pieces first. Uh, but I'm trying to slow down my opponent's ideas and then develop the rest of my pieces that I have and eventually try to use the extra two pawns that I have in the position. So he plays bishop c2. I'm going to go bishop d7, just develop the bishop, maybe rook to c8, maybe some kind of bishop to c3 idea. He plays rook to e2. Let's go for, uh, yeah, I'll go rook to c8, just get on the open file. Maybe bishop to b5 to attack the rook. Maybe bishop c3 at the right time. Bishop c3 looks good right now. White does have this check on g5, I move the king away. And then the rook on e1 still has to move, and then I can still play rook g8. So I think I'm going to go for it here. I'm going to go bishop c3. I, I'm positive his best move is to give the check. I'm not ignorant of that being a possibility here. So he'll check. I'll go to h8. 
And then I can play rook g8 with a gain of time, and I'm still attacking the rook on e1. He has to be a bit careful about that. I'm not really threatening to take the rook just yet, because there is this idea of queen f6 check, queen g5 check, and a perpetual check that I definitely don't want to allow here. Um, but I'm going to play rook g8, probably put the rook on g7, double the rooks up, still attack his rook, and... The bishop does a nice job of covering all of these important squares. I don't really want to trade the bishop off until I've got these squares covered pretty well. So let's see what he decides to do. A move like queen h6 would be kind of tricky here. Again, if I take the rook, there's like even knight g5 ideas that would be very bad for me. He could play queen h6 and then knight g5 and try to threaten checkmate. That would actually be a good example of him ignoring my ideas and pressing forward with some of his own threats. I think, though, if he goes queen h6, I'll play rook g8 and put the rook on g7, and that will cover the king side pretty well, as far as I can tell. And uh, then I might take the rook on e1 if he allows me to. I can also go queen f8 and queen g7. That would also be another way of trying to trade pieces. So let's go rook g8 and move the rook away. We go rook g8, we hit the queen. If he goes to h6, this time I can go rook g6 and double up. If he goes to h4, I can go rook g4. Queen h5 is probably his best move, hitting the pawn. Um, he, he decides to retreat. Okay. I'm going to retreat. Uh, I don't want to lose my a7 pawn for free. I'm just going to go for the move b6 real quick, I think. Uh, yeah, we'll just do that. I'm also quite behind on time here, so I'm going to have to speed up. But my goal is to retreat the bishop, double the rooks up. Maybe bishop to b5 to hit the rook at the right time. And yeah, we're going to also look for any trade that's available. I'm going to go for the trade. Like if he hops the knight in, I'm just going to take with the queen or the bishop and just trade all the pieces I can. Knight e5 would also actually lose a piece because once I do all the trades, then the bishop on c2 would be uh, unprotected. So yeah, rook g7, rook g6, double up, bishop b5, bishop back to f6. I like the bishop on f6. Usually a pawn or a bishop that are like two squares uh, away from a knight vertically does a pretty good job of restricting it from moving forward. So the bishop on f6 is a pretty nice location to really keep the knight on f3 uh, completely shut down. But I don't want to I don't want to move you know the rook away before keeping the bishop safe. I want to play probably bishop f6, rook g6, rook g8 in that some kind of move order like that here. Okay, he retreats the knight. Uh, here I'm just going to go ahead and trade pieces. I can take this knight. Also, when he takes back with the rook, I do have the bishop that is able to be captured. And I'm not worried about any kind of checks here because I can block with the rook. And then I'm now I'm just up a piece in this position. Probably now that I'm up a piece. Yeah, so he does check. I have to block with the rook here. If I block with pawns, he'll just capture them. Probably here the game plan is to consolidate a bit. I'm probably going to bring the rook back around to protect. Maybe try to offer a queen trade. Uh, I have to be a little bit careful about my king here, quite honestly. I can maybe play king g8 also to get away from the pin. There's no back rank issues. Okay, he goes. He wants to play rook g3 here. I'm going to play the move king g8. I'm just getting away from the pin. If he goes rook g3, I'll just trade the rooks. It is a little awkward to have my rook kind of fianchettoed on the g7 square, but I'll go queen c5 also and maybe check on the back rank and... I'm really just trying to trade pieces. Queen f6 would be a little bit annoying here, quite honestly. He goes queen d3. I'm going to go for queen c5. The idea is to check on the back rank, take advantage of white's slightly weakened back rank, and also just try to trade rooks. That's, that's kind of the game plan here. I think he was maybe going for rook g3. Okay, he plays rook e2. I can check here on the back rank. If he trades the rooks, he will get back rank mated. He needs to retreat this rook to the e1 square, and then from there I can just trade rooks uh, at that point. I could have also traded rooks right away, but I'm kind of giving him a little bit of an opportunity to make a mistake. Just like this, for example, he blocked with the queen, so I can take that. Uh, now I'm going to play bishop b5 to attack the rook. He's probably going to move the rook over. Okay, um, here I'm going to play the move rook to g4. No back rank problems. I can always move the king up to g7. So even if he plays something like rook here and tries to check, I have the g7 square available and I'm not going to get checkmated. So I'm going to move the queen, move the king up the board. Could have moved the queen anywhere else. That would have 
you know, queen a3 was maybe even a tad bit better. Here I am attacking the rook, so he has to be careful about that idea. And maybe, okay, he does that. I'm going to just push the d-pawn down the board. As I've talked about in other episodes, when you have a passed pawn, you usually just want to shove it down the board as quickly as you can. So I'm going to push d3, d2, try to promote the pawn. That is the game plan here. I also can check on d4 at the right time. So let's just push. I'm going to play bishop here to attack the... Uh, well, here I'm attacking the king as well as the rook, so... He is losing the rook on e to, uh, b2. Then we'll go here, or queen c1. Queen c1 looks pretty good. If it takes the queen, I make a new one. Okay, we can eliminate that rook and make a new queen. And then here, I think we are guaranteed the checkmate on g2 that we're piling up on. He can't move the pawn since it's pinned, and we're just going to take the pawn on g2 next move. Okay, and that is the game there. Got a little close on time there at the end, but we were pretty much better throughout the entire game. I think this was a pretty good game in regards to a lot of learning opportunities, so let's go back through it here. So our opponent plays the London system. We go for our early c5 advance, which we are uh, doing in this repertoire. He plays c3. We attack the pawn on b2. We're also putting a little bit of pressure on the d4 pawn at the same time. Um, and yeah, the move b3 is, I think, one of the more common moves that you'll see in your games at this rating level. Um, other options that are available are queen to c2, queen to b3, queen to d2. These are other ways of keeping the pawn on b2 protected. Uh, but I would assume that pawn to b3 is going to be a very common move uh, at this level that we're at. The downside, as I mentioned during the game, though, is that with the move pawn to b3, you are kind of opening up more of this diagonal, which eventually became a problem for our opponent as the game went on. And you're also weakening sometimes the a3 and c3 squares. One example of how that could be relevant is, for for instance, if I did trade the pawns and then check with the queen for some, you know, for just for instance, no longer can you block with a knight because you no longer have the pawn on b2. If the pawn was on b2, then you could block with the knight. Now you can't do that. I don't think this is the best way to play, though. I think white would just block with the queen, and I don't really see anything special for us. So instead, though, uh, I decided to play the move g6. He went for e3. I do put the bishop on the g7 square. I played d5 mainly to stop his knight from jumping forward to attack our queen. Develop the knight, hit the bishop, and I'm I'm pretty positive that white's best move is to play bishop g5 here. They really should just keep the bishop alive and not let us capture it. Even if they have do play the move uh, bishop g5, I think my plan was to play the move pawn to e5 here. I don't know if I should castle first or not, but pawn to e5 is usually the plan in these types of positions. If white trades the pawns in the center, you know, in a, a situation like this, we've got pressure on their c3 pawn. We can castle. I think black is in pretty good shape here. We also have a pretty big space advantage because of our two pawns in the center of the board, so I'd be pretty happy with this position. Um, if they don't capture the pawn, I am threatening to push the pawn further up the board and make a fork, so white has to watch out for that. They could take the pawn on c5 instead, I think this is a worse version of things, though, because once I recapture, I'm still attacking the c3 pawn, and I am threatening to make the fork with the pawn going up to e4. And there's really not a great way for white to stop both of those. So generally speaking, in this type of pawn structure, when you have pawns on you know, c3, d4, e3, and we have pawns on c5, d5, you want to try to work towards this e5 pawn advance. It does need some pre preparation, um, and trying to get rid of the bishop on f4 is one way of trying to do that. In the game, though, I made a big mistake by castling. We do trade pawns in the center first, then take the bishop, then take the pawn. I think I could have also taken the bishop first. I don't know if the move order matters a ton. This would have been, you know, the exact same position as we got in the game. So anyways, though, I took this way first. They can't take back with the e-pawn because they lose the bishop. So they take with the c-pawn. Take, 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 take. And yeah, I, I think that queen takes is going to be objectively the best move because it is very difficult for white to deal with all of these threats. But what I was a little bit bothered by here was this check on b5. Maybe we block with the bishop. Pieces get traded. I am still attacking a number of things in this position, so I think we're still in good shape. But maybe white throws in a check with the queen and then moves the knight. And okay, I think black is still better here, but I could see some trouble occurring with my king being on the d7 square. Maybe instead of blocking with the bishop, maybe it's better to move the king over. 
and then white is still faced with uh, a, a variety of problems. Objectively speaking, I do think this is better than what I did in the game, but I also wanted to show that you don't necessarily have to spot like every single tactic to win these games. Um, we did have the tactic of winning the pawn in the first place. You don't necessarily have to win a second pawn in order to win the game later as well. So I took with the bishop instead, castled, moved the bishop back. They, in the game, they do give us a second pawn for free, so we take it. I don't want to take with the bishop because the difference here is they would have the queen opened up towards the d-pawn. So I took this way, defend the pawn. And pretty much at this point, when we're ahead of the material, but we still have some problems in our position to fix, we're in what you could kind of call like the consolidation phase. I am up two pawns, which is great, but I the problem with my position is I don't really have that great of development, and my king is a little bit weak in this case. If I can fix these things, as I talked about during the game, maybe a king h8, rook g8, bishop d7, like get the rest of my pieces in the game and fix my king a little bit, then, then we're going to be much, much better as black. If we're not careful, white could stir up some trouble. So I was constantly trying to prevent our opponent from doing things that would bother us. Uh, for instance, if I go king h8, maybe queen h6 is annoying, and then the queen retreats, and then knight, you know, knight tries to jump in and attack us. And this is starting to get a little bit uncomfortable, I will say. So I decided to stop the queen from invading, develop the bishop, develop the rook, made the skewer. I knew this wasn't going to win material because white had the check. But then we get to play rook g8 and attack the queen. I kept the a-pawn safe. And then here we capture the knight, win another piece, or win a piece, defend against his threats. And again, always needing to be aware of what the opponent's trying to do. He might want to play rook to g3 to attack my pin piece. I'm just going to play king g8 to get away from the pin. So always not only focusing on our own plans, but also trying to stop the opponent from what they want to do a lot of the time. And then as the game went on, we traded more pieces, we won the queen, eventually we won more material, and then the game was over later. Okay, so that's it for our first game. Let's get into our second one. All right, so we got game number two. Our opponent plays d4, we go knight f6. And this particular opponent, uh, by the way, Ricardo... Aldaz, rated 12.29 from Uruguay, uh, goes for the move c3 on move number two. So against the move c3, uh, let's see here. Generally speaking, my rule of thumb, as I've mentioned in other uh, games and other episodes, is we're going to go for the move pawn to c5. If our opponent is not threatening or aiming to play the move uh, pawn to e4 on the second move of the game. So we're going to stick with that rule of thumb here. We're going to continue with the move pawn to uh, c5. Uh, it would not surprise me if this opponent played something like bishop f4 for a London system. I'm not entirely sure what their goal was with c3. But okay, they play the move pawn to d5. So they are advancing up the board. They are gaining some extra space here. The drawback to white's move order here in the opening, usually d5 is a good response to move c5 in most situations, but usually you don't want to have played c3 before it. Uh, this is a bit of a weird way of playing the opening. Um, so what I'm going to do is stick to our kind of Binko-esque way of playing, and I'm going to recommend, uh, or not just recommend, I'm going to go for the move pawn to b5 here. I don't think I have pawn to c3 on the second move of the game in my course. Uh, however, there are some variations where white does play the move pawn to c3, and we want to be, um, you know, answering that appropriately. Uh, I do think if white had played a slightly different move order, like let's say if white had played maybe uh, maybe knight f3 on the second move of the game, and then we go for c5, they go for d5, we go for b5. I do think their c3 is a variation that I have in the course, but not in this particular move order. So here white decides to play the move e3 in response. They are attacking our pawn that is on the b5 square. And my general rule of thumb in these positions, when we've played knight f6, c5, b5, and the opponent does not have the pawn on c4, my general rule of thumb there is to answer the threat on the pawn by pushing the pawn forward to b4. It's not the only good way of playing by any means. Uh, I think a6, for example, is another way that's very viable. Uh, maybe even c4 is a potential idea. Um, generally speaking, I would recommend the move uh, pawn to b4. Um, in a position like this. Now, 
it's interesting in this particular situation that we could ignore the threat on the pawn on b5 and play a move like bishop to b7 instead. Uh, pretty much there we would be counterattacking white's pawn on d5 and giving up the b5 pawn in the process. So white could take the pawn on b5, we would answer by taking on d5. That would generally be a favorable trade of pawns for us because we're trading off a pawn that's further away from the center of the board for one of white's pawns that isn't the center of the board. So that's also an option I'm considering here as well. There's b4 and there's bishop to b7. Um, I think in this move order here, I, I think I'm going to go for, let's see, I think both of them have their pros and cons in some regards. I'm going to go for the bishop to b7 move, and we're going to see what white does about the pawn on d5. If they take on b5 and we get to take the d5 pawn, we're pretty happy about that. Okay, they do take the b5 pawn. Uh, I'm going to take on d5 with the bishop, attacking the pawn on g2. And we are pretty happy about this trade of pawns, as I said uh, just a moment ago, because again, we're trading off one of our opponent's central pawns for a pawn of ours that was not a central pawn. We do end up having an isolated a pawn, but I think the upsides outweigh the downsides in the grand scheme of things. Okay, with that in mind, uh, what we're going to do as a follow-up here is... I think I'm going to go for g6, put the bishop on g7, and castle the king. It is also possible to play e6 and put the bishop on e7 instead, uh, but I'm going to go for the g6, bishop, g7 route. So they played knight to d2. I'm just going to continue my development, castle the king pretty quickly, develop the rest of my pieces, and ultimately I want to try to put as many pawns in the center of the board as I can because I do have two central pawns on the E and D files compared to my opponent who has only one central pawn on the, uh, on the E file. So we'll see what white does about this. I'm, ex I'm expecting them to do something like castling here. Uh, okay, they play the move A4. I'm just going to go ahead and castle. I don't see anything really wrong with just uh, continuing my development on the king side part of the board. I'm expecting, you know, again, white the castle at some point here. And so the game plan is probably to retreat the bishop. Okay, they go knight to b3. Uh, I mean, they are attacking the pawn on c5, so we do want to uh, address that threat in some way. Um, the knight is protected by the queen also, so I'm not necessarily rushing to capture the knight. I think I'm just going to play the move pawn to d6. We'll just play it safe here. We'll just guard the pawn. The knight is protecting the bishop, so that's not really a concern. Pretty soon I will drop the bishop back, develop the knight. I can also develop the knight to d7. Maybe, oops, sorry, uh, maybe even put a rook on the b file lining up towards the bishop and the knight on b3. That could also be an interesting idea uh, that white has to deal with. So here white plays the move bishop to d3. And this move ends up being a tactical mistake, as far as I can tell, uh, because I believe we have the option of playing pawn to c4 here. And I don't really see a way for white to deal with the fork that we have here, where we would be attacking the bishop and the knight simultaneously with the pawn. Uh, there's really only one counter-attacking move. They could play something like pawn to e4, but I think we can just either retreat the bishop or take that pawn with the knight, and I think we're still maintaining the fork. So as far as I can tell, pawn to c4 is going to win us a piece. And yeah, I'm not really sure what white's kind of maneuvers they've been playing here the past couple of moves are all about. I think that they should have just been castling and developing, pretty much. They moved the knight from b1 to d2 to b3, so they moved the knight a few times. They moved the bishop back and forth a few times. They're still not castled yet. So we're going to go ahead and take the bishop on d3. And here on top of it, I think we have another tactical opportunity here as well. I think we can actually win another piece in this position with a forcing move sequence. Uh, here we can play the move e5, attacking this knight. And then once that knight moves away, we'll play the move e4, make another pawn fork. Uh, two pawn forks back to back almost is uh, pretty rare. <laughs> but um, we're going to be winning you know, another piece in this position. White can't really save the knight and defend against the uh, the second follow-up pawn fork in this position here. So, yeah, for the most part in this game, we were just 
focusing around the center of the board, getting rid of the d5 pawn, willing to trade off their d pawn for our b pawn, and then white makes some mistakes here, kind of moving their pieces back and forth that gets them into trouble, and they are, you know, they lost a piece, they're going to lose a second piece. They move the queen away so they avoid the pawn fork, but we do just take the knight anyways. And yeah, we're just ahead a bunch of material in this kind of position. So they take back with the c-pawn. Um, I think that they do finally want to castle. And I'm going to be kind of annoying. I'm going to play the move queen to c8. My idea is that if white does castle, I have the move bishop to c4, which will skewer the queen to the rook, and this is going to win even more material in this position. Uh, I played the move queen to c8 specifically. I did not put the queen on c7, because if my queen was on c7 right now, white would be able to play the move queen to c2 and pin my bishop, because my queen on c7 would not have been protected. Here, the queen is protected, so queen to c2, I would just take the rook, and my, my own rook is protecting my queen. So we're going to take the rook. They're going to take back. And yeah, so here we are ahead, uh, we're ahead a knight and a rook. Um, we're down two pawns, but we're ahead a knight and a rook, which is obviously very good for us. So the next step is to continue improving pieces. Um, I'm going to go for the move knight to e4. This just makes it more difficult for white to develop. If they develop the bishop, I will just take the bishop in that case. They play the move b4. I think they want to play bishop to b2. Um, let's see here. I can just put the queen on c2, quite honestly, and just really stop white from moving any of their pieces. And then next I'll develop my other knight, get, excuse me, get the rooks in the game. Okay, they play the bishop to this square. Uh, I can go knight to d2 and trade more pieces, but okay, I'm going to finally develop some new stuff. I could also take the a4 pawn, but I'm going to prioritize development. Let's go knight to d7, develop more pieces. Uh, they push the pawn, they are attacking d6, but that pawn is also protected. So I'm just going to involve the rook in the game. Uh, also, I'm getting it away from the bishop aiming at it, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. And yeah, again, we're just up a ton of material. We're up a rook, we're up a knight. Down a few pawns, but that really doesn't matter all that much in this uh, kind of position. So let's see what white decides to do. They play the move h3. Um, let's go ahead and, hmm, I'm going to go for the move knight to b6, and look to put the knight on the c4 square, or take the pawn on a4, just moving my pieces up the board and trying to make, make progress. If they do push the pawn up to a5, uh, then I would have played the move knight to c4. Here they move the king to h2. What changes about the position as soon as white moves the king to the h2 square is that they are no longer protecting this pawn on f2. And so as far as I'm aware, I can just go ahead and capture this pawn on f2. And I would be very happy to trade the queens because I am ahead a bunch of material here. Without the queens on the board, you know, no real complications that I have to be concerned about. My queen was much more active than the opponent's queen, but getting pieces off of the board does kind of simplify my life. Um, Okay, we're going to bring the knight back to the e4 square, attack the bishop. Uh, next, I'll go knight to d5, attack the bishop and the pawn. Just trying to hunt pieces down and go for more trades. That's my game plan here. And the problem for white is they really can't avoid any, uh, they can't avoid me taking the bishop, uh, even if they move it to the e5 square. Uh, we could take it right away. Uh, I think I'm just going to take the pawn on e3 first. And if white plays something like rook to e1, I have the move rook to c3 to protect the knight. My knights would be skewered, but I can protect the knight in the front of the two, uh, in front of the two, and not lose any material in this position. Keep in mind, whenever you're being threatened by an opponent, there are uh, three. There's more than three, but I would kind of say three main types of defensive options available usually. Uh, I'll probably talk about this more in a future kind of instructional video down the road, but when you're uh, being attacked, the you can capture the piece that's doing the attacking, you can protect the piece that's being attacked, or you can retreat uh, or move away the piece that is being attacked. In this case, we're protecting the piece that's being attacked, so that's how we're avoiding, uh, that's how we're avoiding losing any material. Okay, I'm going to play the move rook to c8. Um...
yeah, let's just do rook to c8 here. If he puts the knight on c6, quite honestly, I'll probably just take the knight. Uh, I will eliminate the knight here uh, in this position, I think. The knight's just relatively annoying. Let's just get rid of that. Now, I don't necessarily want to take again because I would also lose my knight. So what I'll do here is I'll push the pawn up the board to protect this knight, and then I will eliminate uh, then I will eliminate the c-pawn. I'm stopping it from promoting here. So I keep the e3 knight protected. If he takes the knight, I take with the pawn. And now next move, he can't really do anything about me. Uh, he can't really do much about me taking the pawn on c7. Once the pawn's gone, very little counterplay for our opponent. There's really not a lot of uh, chances for them to turn the game around. So I'm going to throw in a check here. If he moves the king up the board, this is a very nice kind of uh, mating configuration. And we do get the win. The king has no available squares to move away to. Okay, so let's go back through the game and analyze it. So d4, knight f6, c3, we go for c5. Uh, I think if you wanted to play the move d5 in this position, it's also absolutely fine. But I think that I want to generally look for the move c5 if possible. Uh, again, assuming that white's not looking to play the move e4 uh, on, the on the second or third move of the game. So they go d5, we go b5. I don't think this is the only good way of playing. You could also go for something like e6, which is probably a little bit more... Um, Probably objectively, this is a little more of the better move because you're immediately striking at the center and you're kind of saying to white that they wasted time with the c3 move. I'm pretty sure white's best move is probably to be play the move c4 here just to reinforce the center. But if their best move is to play c4, then why did they play c3 in the first place? So we decide to keep it in kind of a binko-esque territory though with the move b5 first and then bishop to b7 to target the d-pawn. We're very happy to make this trade of pawns. Uh, and then we just kind of continue developing. We castle, we defend against our opponent's threat. And then so far, so, you know, I, I think black has a better position here in the, in the grand scheme of things, but white's not down any material. White's in a relatively solid position. Um, you know, probably white's best move is just to go ahead and castle in this position. And I would rather be black, but again, white's not actually down material or lost or anything like that. Their first uh, big mistake, you could call it, is playing this move bishop to d3, which does allow us to push the pawn up the board and we make the fork. So once we've picked up this piece, then we are actually going to pick up a second piece because of the pawns kind of bulldozing down the board. If the knight had moved away somewhere, we would have played e4. Our bishop is defended. The, uh, the queen and the knight are both being forked. The queen moves, we take the knight, we're up two pieces, life is good. Uh, pretty much that's what happens in the game. They move away from the fork, but we do take this knight anyways. Um, and then when you're ahead two pieces like this, there's a couple of different ways you can work towards converting advantages. Uh, number one, the general rule of thumb is you want to try to trade pieces to simplify the game, get into the end game, take away as much counterplay from your opponent as you can. Uh, and the less pieces on the board, the easier that is to accomplish usually. The, another thing you can do is not only just try to trade pieces, but you can also be uh, very hyper aware of what the opponent wants to do with their own moves on their side of the board. So if I can stop my opponent from what they want to do, and I'm already ahead a piece, or in this case, two pieces uh, to begin with, then it makes life very, very difficult for the opponent. Because if you don't ever let them get back into the game, then they're down two pieces you know, for the rest of the game. Uh, the only way that white can really hope to win a game like this is to, that somehow black makes a mistake or we, uh, or that black allows white to create counterplay or lets the position get messy. If you try to actively stop that from happening at every turn, uh, then life becomes very difficult for the opponent in those cases. So queen to c8 was geared around preventing them from castling. If they do castle as they did in the game, then I make the skewer, I win the rook. And I'm just ahead a ton of material, and I'm continuing to stop my opponent from doing what they want to do. I thought they might want to develop the bishop, so I control that square. I thought they might want to develop the bishop. I guess this didn't really stop the bit. Well, I, I thought the bishop was going to go to b2. Uh, I do stop that move, but I didn't stop the other bishop move. Develop the rest of my stuff. Capture another free pawn. And then from here, it's all about just trading stuff, defending against his threats. Uh, when you're ahead so much material, it's also generally a good idea to sometimes give up or give back some of that material in return for um, simplifying the position. 
Here I was willing to give up my rook for the opponent's knight, because even if I lose a little bit of material in this kind of situation, I get I get an extra kind of pair of pieces off of the board. And I'm the one that has all the stuff left on the board. Um, once I eliminate the C-pawn, as we saw in the game, white's just down two knights, which is very bad for them. And then eventually they walked into a checkmate. So that's the way this game went. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our uh, third and final one. All right, so we've got our next game. We're playing against UBGSS, rated uh, 1242. They start off with d d4, knight f6, they go for e3. We're going to continue with our move pawn to c5, striking against our opponent's center, trying to go for a Binko Gambit-esque type of position. For instance, if they play pawn to d5, we are going to play pawn to e6, uh, maybe play b5 at the right moment, but usually b5 will most likely occur when our opponent has the pawn on c4 already. In this case, though, they decide to take the ball on c5, which at this rating level definitely is one of the most common approaches. Uh, many players we've seen throughout the speedrun series do capture the ball on c5, uh, maybe thinking that they're going to be able to hold on to it. But as we've seen in other uh, games, usually that doesn't occur very easily for them. So we go with the move e6. The plan is to take back on c5 with the bishop. If white does go pawn to b4, they reinforce the ball on c5, but... There's ways we can work around this. Uh, usually they're not going to be able to hold on to the pawn for very long. So this particular opponent decides to allow us to capture the pawn. So we do happily take on the c5 square. They go bishop to d3. And uh, we're going to go ahead and I think we're going to start off with pawn to d5, just grabbing some central space in the middle of the board. And then we're going to go ahead and castle the king. So... It is a position that is a little bit more favorable for black in the grand scheme of things. We do have two central pawns compared to our opponent's one central pawn. Uh, but if white knows what they're doing, or if white is precise, they should try to play the move pawn to e4 in the near future uh, so that they can gain a little bit of a foothold in the center of the board with one of their own pawns, and also so that they can challenge our, uh, our pawn in the center a little bit. So... After knight c3, I'm just going to continue with the move knight to c6. We're just going to develop our pieces. If they do play pawn to e4, uh, we'll kind of decide what to do at that point. We might play d4. We might take the pawn. Uh, if they don't play pawn to e4, we are probably going to be playing pawn to e5 ourselves just to get two pawns directly within the four central squares in the middle of the board. And if we can push the pawn to e5, we might even be able to push it up to e4 where it will fork the bishop and the knight. We did see in the previous game a couple of different uh, pawn forks on very, very uh, similar locations on the board. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens in this one here. I do think pawn to e4 is one of white's best moves, though. It does also open up the bishop on c1. Uh, it doesn't necessarily fix all of their problems, but it is a uh, you know probably one of their better options in the grand scheme of things. So white decides to go for the move bishop to d2. We're going to continue with the e5 idea now that our knight on c6 is protecting it. And the threat in this current position is to play the move e4, forking the knight and the bishop. Uh, so white needs to do something about this threat. Once again, I think e4 is still the best way to address it. Um, if they're not going to play pawn to, oops, sorry, if they're not going to play pawn to e4, then they need to move the bishop or the knight away from the d3 and, um, and f3 squares. So Okay, this is another option that I didn't consider, but I don't think it's one that's all that bothersome. Our opponent plays the move knight to a4. They are attacking our bishop on c5. And that is another way of kind of distracting us from playing the move pawn to e4. Because now if we go ahead and make the fork, they'll take the bishop. And then we're not really winning material. We're actually just kind of, you know, they get a piece of ours, we get a piece of theirs. It's a little bit closer to a trade. Uh, against knight a4, I'm going to retreat the bishop all the way back to the e7 square, I think. Um, I think bishop d6 is actually good, too. Yeah, may maybe I'll lean towards bishop d6, actually. Uh, I'm going to go for that option. We're still threatening pawn to e4. That's still our main idea here. And white decides to move the bishop away to the b5 square. Okay, so against this here, uh, I'm still going to continue by pushing the pawn up to e5. We are attack. Uh, sorry, up to the e4 square. We're attacking the knight. Depending on where the knight moves to, we very well may have a kind of Greek gift sacrifice type of idea here. Uh, so white decides to take our knight on c6. 
Now we have two different options here. Do we take the knight that's on f3 or do we take the bishop that's on c6? Um, I'm leaning towards the knight on f3 because if we take the knight on f3, we are still attacking the bishop on c6 in the process. And the only safe way for white to save the bishop is to bring it back to the b5 square. But once we have that pawn on f3, that opens up a lot more attacking opportunities that we would have around the opponent's king. We can probably take the pawn on g2, continue blasting open the king there. And I think white's going to be in a lot of trouble in that situation. Quite honestly, I do also think taking the bishop on c6 is good too. Because if the knight moves, I still think we have some of these bishop takes h2 kind of Greek gift sacrifice types of ideas. If you're not familiar with what that pattern is, um, it's one where you sacrifice a bishop on the h2 square, they take with the king, you bring the knight up to g4 with check, you bring the queen over to h4, and you get a very dangerous attack if the right kind of criteria or circumstances are met. All that being said, I'm going to take the knight rather than taking the bishop. We still maintain the attack on the bishop, but we also get the pawn closer over here towards the opponent's king, and white is having very, very few pieces near the king at this point. So white decides to take the uh, the pawn on v7. So here we have an interesting moment. We can take the bishop on b7. White will take on f3 probably, and we're up a piece, so life is good. Uh, another option is to take on g2, ignoring white's move, and attacking the rook on h1 ourselves. So we take the pawn, they might take our rook, we take their rook, they take back with the queen. It looks maybe somewhat dangerous for white, but I'm not entirely sure if we have a breakthrough in that position, quite honestly. Um, another option is to play bishop takes h2 check right now in this kind of position. I think for the sake of simplicity here, to be quite honest with you, I, there might be moves that are better than what I'm about to play, but I think I'm going to settle on the move bishop takes b7. Uh, I'm going to let white take on f3 here, and we are going to be up a piece for two pawns with a very good position, um, but we are not uh, we are not like checkmating white necessarily in this kind of scenario here. That being said, very good position ahead material. So here the question is, how do we want to proceed? Knight to e4, attacking the bishop on d2 looks very reasonable. Queen to d7, attacking the knight on a4, and also protecting our bishop looks good. I'm kind of leaning towards the queen to d7 move, because I want to hit the knight, guard the bishop, and once the bishop is protected, I can push the pawn off of the d5 square, and then I would be attacking the queen that's on f3. In the game, white retreats the queen all the way back to the starting square, but this didn't really address my threat of attacking the knight. And now I'm ahead two pieces for free in this position. And I think I can still now execute one of these, this kind of uh, Greek gift sacrifice type of idea. So I was mentioning it earlier, but I think I can still pull it off here. We can go bishop takes h2 check. King takes h2. Swing the queen over to h4 with check. King retreats. Then knight to g4, threatening checkmate with queen to h2 because the knight would guard the queen. The only way for white to avoid checkmate is either sacrificing their queen for the knight, which we're very happy about, or they would have to move the rook away so that they open up the f1 square for the king. And after rook to e1, we can take the pawn on f2. Oops, there I was wrong. We can take the pawn on f2 because our knight's on g4 and the rook is no longer protecting the pawn. The king has to go back to h1. We can repeat with a few extra checks. I, I think to save you, <laughs> to save the viewers here, all of the uh, craziness with a ton of different arrows and super long calculation, I'll just kind of show the sequence here. So we take the pawn, the king does take, we bring the queen over for check, king has to go to g1, and then the knight goes to g4. And through, usually the Greek gift sacrifice is done through a slightly different move order. Usually it's you capture with the bishop, and then you check with the knight first before the queen is involved. Um, so, like, you would go knight g4 check and then queen h4. The reason we don't want to go knight g4 check here is because once the king retreats, we can't jump over the knight to the h4 square, and so we kind of need to pick the right move order. That's why we're checking with the queen first and then involving the knight. So the main threat, of course, right now is queen h2 checkmate. And as I said, white either needs to sacrifice the queen, which we're definitely happy about, 
or they need to move the rook away so that if we check on h2, they can escape to the uh, to the f1 square. But the problem is, if they move the rook away to e1, they are no longer protecting the f2 pawn, and we can take the pawn on f2 with check. Uh, and then I think we're still going to be able to deliver a checkmate. Um, it'll take a little little longer sequence, but I think after rook e1, take this pawn with check, king moves, check on h4, king goes back to g1, check on h2, king goes to f1, check on h1, king goes to e2, check on g2 by taking the pawn, the king comes up to d3. I guess we may not have checkmate necessarily, but at the very, very least, we have knight f2 check forking the king and the queen. So, okay, white simplifies our task a little bit, well, may, maybe a good, a good amount. <laughs> By taking the knight, we can simply take back, and now we just have a full extra queen. We're up eight points in material, we're up a queen, down a pawn, the game is definitely over at this point. I want to push the d-pawn, open up the bishop, and try to checkmate on g2 is my idea. They play f3, that attacks my queen and blocks off the bishop. I'll just go ahead and um, I'll just come back to the g6 square and hit the c2 pawn. And yeah, we're just playing with an extra queen, so it's definitely a completely winning position for black at this point. So let's see how white addresses our threat. If white does nothing, I'm just going to pick the pawn up. If they protect the pawn, I'll probably just involve another rook to attack the pawn. But yeah, we're up a ton of material. Um, in the analysis afterwards, I'll show the sequence that could have happened if white had not given up their queen uh, to show you how we would have continued attacking if they had moved the rook and tried to run with the king. So let's see what white decides to do here. If they, as I said, the threat mainly is to take the ball and I'm going to activate the pieces, try to trade rooks. If I can get all the rooks off the board and then just use my extra queen a lot easier, then that's going to be good. We also don't necessarily have to go for piece trades. We are ahead so much material that we could also just try to use the extra material to go checkmate our opponent. Lots of winning methods from here. The biggest thing usually when you're ahead material is just trying to shut down counterplay and still being on the lookout for the opponent's threats, making sure you're not walking into a blunder or into a trap or losing a, you know, a rook or a queen or something like that. Uh, you don't want to lose your advantages is, is the key here. Okay, looks like our opponent let the clock run. Not going to make you uh, sit through the, the, the time ticking down there. But yeah, let's go ahead and go back and analyze the game. So it starts off with d4, knight f6, e3, we go for our c5 move. White captures the pawn, which is one of the very common ways we've seen throughout the speedrun series of players playing at this rating range. We go e6, we do win the pawn back on c5. Uh, as we've seen before, if white tries to be really greedy and defend the pawn, if they do something like pawn to b4, here you can have multiple different ideas that are good. Uh, I like going for the move pawn to a5, try to pull, uh, pull out the rug from underneath the c5 pawn. If white plays c3 to reinforce the pawn, you trade pawns, you play b6. If they take on b6, you take on b4 with check, then you take on b6, and you win the pawn back. It's now equal material, and white's left over with an isolated a pawn and one less pawn in the center of the board. So black is already a little bit better out of the opening here. So being super greedy is not usually white's best idea. Uh, knight f3, as they played, is a totally fine move. We take, control the center, castle. And the best move for white in this kind of position is definitely for them to play c4 in the near future whether they play it right away or a couple moves down the road. But white really needs to fight against our central space control, uh, where we have a pawn on d5 in the middle of the board and they have no pawns in the center. So after the move c4, there's a couple of options that are available. You could go ahead and trade the pawns and get yourself into a completely symmetrical position where you're up one move. So black is actually a little bit better off in these kind of positions, uh, mainly because you're kind of one move ahead of white which is usually not the case in most openings. Uh, but it's a very, very small marginal advantage. Uh, if you want to play a little bit more dynamically, I recommend just developing your knight. And if they ever take the pawn on d5, you can take back with your own pawn. And you end up having an isolated queen pawn in the center of the board, which is both a strength and a weakness at the same time. It does give us more space in the center. 
but it's also an isolated bond simultaneously. So there's pluses and minuses to this approach. So it's more of a double-edged, you know, if you're trying to win, this is probably the way you should play. If you're okay with the draw and you're playing against, or you're playing against somebody higher rated or whatever it might be, then trading the bonds is, you know, this is probably a pretty equal, uh, a pretty good path to equality here. Anyways, though, this opponent went knight c3, and they never really got around to playing that e4 move. I do think e4 is definitely the best move that white should go for. Again, when you're behind on space, as white is from the opening phase, you really need to fight against that central space control that the opponent has and try to uh, also put a pawn in the center yourself. Against pawn to e4, I was probably going to... I think I would have taken the pawn. I'm not really sure if I would take. Maybe I would push. Maybe pushing is a little bit better. That way, when you kick the knight backwards, then you can play a move like e5. And here, we're actually back to gaining a space advantage. But at least in comparison to the way the game went, white has at least one pawn in the middle board. So I do think that would have been a better way for white to play. Bishop d2 allowed us to gain more space in the center. I think, once again, white really needs to play e4. We would go d4, and again, we're a little bit better. But they played knight a4, the bishop retreated, and then they really did just let us start advancing in the center of the board, using our space advantage, opening up the bishop on d6. And we had a lot of these ideas uh, that we saw later in the game of taking on h2 uh, in the right circumstance. So they took our knight. We got their knight. They took our pawn. I decided to go the simple route and recapture with the bishop on b7. It may be better to take on g2 or to maybe take on h2. I think that these options do end up working. The computer at least says that both of these moves do work. But I think quite honestly, in a case like this, there's a lot of moves that are available that are good. You probably can't go wrong by just taking a free piece. I mean, I, I think rather than burning a lot of time on the clock, I think taking the bishop on b7 is the simplest way to work towards winning the game. And then we attack the knight. And my assumption was that white was going to deal with the knight. If they move the knight back to c3, then we can play the move d4, opening up the attack on the queen, attacking the knight, and here white loses a piece. If they played pawn to b3, I was probably still going to play pawn to d4 anyways and try to uh, try to stir up some kind of attack uh, over in the king's side direction here. But in the game, they didn't guard the knight. We took the knight. And then we did still get to execute this bishop takes h2 type of sacrifice. And I think white should have maybe tried the move rook e1. I would have to find a, you know, a sequence of moves to win the game. I am still ahead of piece even if I don't have a checkmate though. So maybe in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. But I think we can take on f2. Uh, king moves. Check on h4. Check on h2 again. Check here. Take this pawn. This is this kind of pattern of taking the f-pawn, coming back to h4, uh, to the h-file, then going to h2. The main purpose of doing that is if you try to check on h2 and then h1, because the pawn is still on the f2 square, when, it, when we do take the pawn on g2, it's not coming with a check this time. It's still a very good position for black, no doubt, but you want to try to have all of your moves be checks if you're attacking it, you know, in a lot of situations. So that's why you take the pawn on... Uh, you take the pawn on f2 first, and then once you get around to this position, now because we took the pawn on f2 earlier, now it is a check. The king would move. Um, there might be some kind of checkmate at some point around here, but I think the simplest is just to check, take the queen, and yeah, you should win the game with an extra queen for sure. That's pretty close to what happens in the game because white gives up the queen anyways, and then here they ended up just abandoning the game and letting their time tick out for the last five and a half minutes. So we got the win, and uh, that's it for this one. So this was the three games for this rating range of uh, 1,200 to 1,300. Hopefully you enjoy these games. I will see you around in the next video in the speedrun series.